responsibility of parents and teachers and schools is perhaps as ancient as the foundation of education itself. A case in point is homework, which exemplifies this triangle of participation and mutual reciprocity. For all its intents and purposes, homework extends the boundaries of school to the four corners of every home, which houses a student in it, and it reminds parents as well that they too are teachers, whether willingly or unwillingly. In ordinary circumstances, for others, bringing the school at home is a personal choice or preference, even a privilege as it is done for the sake of convenience, be that for kids or parents or both. I think many of us teachers and parents alike have already grown accustomed to the idea that the school is the second home to students because in ordinary situations, it appears that students spend more time in school than at home. However, the current health crisis is highlighting the often unsung reality that the home is second school to students. Moreover, in school, it is normative for teachers to take responsibility for their students by acting as second parents to them. Thus, we invoke in loco parentis. But I aver that the reverse is also equally true at home where it behooves parents to be responsible in acting as teachers to their children, hence in loco magistrorum. That the home is also a school and that parents are also teachers, as I have already pointed out, are realities already in our midst. However, the new normal engendered by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has restricted our movements and consequentially our options to, have brought to light such realities in epic proportions extraordinary circumstances must be met with extraordinary measures. The challenge to education that our generation is now thrust into is not unprecedented. As people in not so distant times have had their dark moments too, like World War I, influenza pandemic, and World War II, to name a few. In all of this crisis, education was a collateral damage, and although scathed, people came out alive and strong as ever. This determination to be undaunted, even in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges and vile determination is expressed in the strong admonition of the Secretary of the Department of Education, Dr. Leonor Briones, who urged parents to teach their children courage, hope, to accept change, and to analytically and critically be, and, and, and to be analytical and critical amid the COVID-19 challenges. Therefore, as the title of my paper suggests, empowering the family to make the school come to life in every home, measuring up to the challenges of the new normal in education, I will be sharing with you my thoughts on how the family, which is always a vital cog in the educational system in the Philippines and anywhere else in the world, can be empowered to ensure the continuance of education even in the midst of the limitations brought about by the so-called new normal. To be able to do this, I will be discussing three main points. First, the nature of the family as a cradle of education. Second, the opportunities and crisis brought about by bringing the school to home. And lastly, the imperative for parents in the new normal to exercise their indispensable right and duty to support the education of their children at all costs. Let me begin with the first point, the nature of the family as a cradle of education. How do we begin to imagine the possibility of schools at home? The first point that I would like to elaborate is how the family by its nature is a cradle of education and where parents are teachers. The quintessential image that comes to mind is our national hero, Jose Rizal, looking bored and distracted, gazes at the moths flying by the oil lamp while his mother, Doña Chedora Alonso, was reading to him what was said to be a Spanish book. One must emphasize, as historians would attest, that the moth story, or more popularly known as Gamugamo at ang Lampara, was told by the mother in order to admonish the boy Rizal for not listening. 
I imagine this as a constant engagement or a routine between mother and son, so much so that it was his mother who had the greatest influence on his development as a person, and that the significance of the Mott story to our national hero is indeed life-altering. Doña Chudora, who took to heart her role as mother and teacher, deserves the highest praise for patiently and lovingly inculcating in her son the values that formed him to become the greatest Malayan. I intentionally pointed out that Rizal, just like most of the boys of his age, are often naughty, bored, and distracted when studying at home with their parents. This is to underscore the fact that we are all aware of that teaching kids at home is not for the faint, for the faint of heart. Teachers spend years to earn a degree in education. Some push it further by acquiring a master's degree and to those handful finish a doctorate degree. But then again, degrees do not guarantee that a novice teacher can be straight away good. For one must further pay his or her dues or be tested by fire every day by facing a legion of adorable but dotty little boys and girls who seem to have made it their mission to stretch, a, to stretch a teacher's patience to its breaking point. And for this, I remember the consoling and thoughtful remarks of the great Dr. Florentino Ornedo, who was addressing us young teachers at that time. He said, as teachers, we learn on the job. And to think that only a few can reach that legendary status where the mere mention of their names command fearful reverence, not just among students, but to their peers as well. In the long and short of it, if it's hard enough for a schooled and seasoned teacher to teach, how much more for some parents whose only weapon of choice is a stick on one hand and a death stare on the other? Therefore, something that we all must accept and be ready for is the fact that bringing the school at home needs careful thought, preparations, and a lot of tap on the back for parents there who are about to sail into the great unknown. But against, but against fear mongers who conjure all hindrances and raise concerns that are nevertheless valid, it is our duty to see to it that our children do not just sit idle at home while we wait for the COVID-19 vaccine, which according to scientists or experts may take not just years but decades to be discovered. Thus we invoke the saying, kapag gusto may paraan, Kapag ayaw, may dahilan. Therefore, all is not lost. Our homes are our last resort, and parents, in partnership with teachers and schools, are our frontliners. What can make this possible is the inherent nature of homes to be schools and the God given rights and duties of parents to be teachers. Doña Chodora, teaching his son illumined only by an oil lamp, can perhaps be the image that represents for us the unflinching resolve of a parent to educate their children at all costs. And as proven by his son's greatness, a parent's persistence could yield fruitful results. As we read in the sacred scriptures, train up a child in a way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's according to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Scola Domestica or School at Home via Ecclesia Domestica or Domestic Church. I would like to further stress the point that homes are inherently schools by going back to an ancient expression in the Catholic Church, which calls the family the Ecclesia Domestica. At this point, I would like to invite those who belong to other religions or faith confessions to join me in reflecting on the significance of families to our faith especially in the upbringing or education of our children. From the Catechism of the Catholic Church's description of the expression Ecclesia Domestica, I prefer the following three main themes that appraise the power of the family as a cradle of education. First, parents are leaders by word and example. The opening line of CCC's description of Ecclesia Domestica expresses the very reason the families are being summoned to build the church in their homes. It is a response to growing alienation of the church from the lives of the people and the mounting hostility of the people towards the church. In other words, 
to respond to the difficult or challenging situations that the church is facing. Herein, the power of parents to actively lead their families to participate in the revitalization of the faith is recognized. And this is expressed with special clarity in the document Gravissimum Educationis, which states, this role of parents in education is so important that only with difficulty can it be supplied where it is lacking. Parents are the ones who must create a family atmosphere animated by love and respect for God and man in which the well-rounded personal and social education of children is fostered. Hence, the family is the first school of the social virtues that every society needs. This can be compared to the struggles which Catholic parents continue to experience as a result of the lockdown. For example, indefinite closure of churches which deprives or prevents their families from receiving the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist. One meme that circulated in the social media caught my attention. It shows God and Satan having an exchange as to who gained more out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Satan proudly claims, with COVID-19, I closed your churches. To which God responded by saying, on the contrary, I opened one in every homes. This phenomenon affected not just the Catholic Church, but perhaps most, if not all, religion. True enough, the pandemic was an opportunity to leave out the true essence of Ecclesia Domestica. In the absence of priests and deprived of the sacraments, parents are urged to take it upon themselves to lead their children to leave out the faith through any means available. Many parents that I know gathered their children and taught them how to pray every day the Angelus and the Rosary. Even Bible reading became a practice in some homes. Indeed, if there is one thing that COVID-19 has validated, it is that it is in the bosom of the family that parents are, are by word and example the first heralds of the faith with regard to their children. As Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagler remarks, through the grace of the sacrament of marriage, parents receive the responsibility and privilege of evangelizing their children. Second, parents encourage their children with special care. They should encourage them in the vocation which is proper to each child, fostering with special care any religious vocation. The meaning of domestic church constitutes the holistic well-being of the family and is inclusive of the wide array of activities, whether spiritual or secular, that all the members of the family do together to stay strong as a unit. The myriad of things which parents can do and the great lengths that they are willing to go just to show their children that they are deeply cared for are immense. In gist, what parents would like their children to feel and remember is that their family is always there to support them. This idea is backed by empirical studies which show that strong family support makes a big difference in the life of children and in the life of children who feel the accompaniment of their parents and they are more likely to succeed. For example, one research shows that just 20 minutes of connecting as a family makes a difference and that stellar students profiled from the past 20 years had one thing in common. Surprisingly, these kids came from families who dined together for three or more nights a week. We can infer from such studies that a caring family does not just happen overnight. It is the fruit of conscious and persistent efforts lovingly exerted by both parents and children. A caring family is nurtured by the special care that each member of the family give to one another. Of course, through the good examples set by parents. A caring family is nourished not just by the time they spend together during special occasions, but perpetually or habitually. That is, every day and in everything that every member of the family do for one another. I agree with Denise Roy who averse that families need to be created and the kitchen table is a, powerful, is a powerful metaphor for that creation. What meals together communicate is that you matter to me that I care enough to get myself here. We stay grace, we hold hands, we have some good conversation. 
it is one of those sacred causes. A similar study in the Philippines reveals the positive impact of caring families on the development of children. To wit, the home as a learning support has been found as an important variable in child development and that children perform better in school when they have opportunities to learn from their two primary contexts of development, namely the home and school. The bottom line is that when parents, teachers, and schools support one another and build a strong partnership, it will lead to academic success. What can be gleaned from the domestic church is that the spiritual practices that build and support a Christian family also happen at home under the loving tutelage of parents towards their children. In other words, there are really no boundaries that define sacred spaces because this can be anywhere. For as the Lord says, and I quote, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Matthew chapter 18, verses 20, verse 20. This sacred gathering happens when parents and children come together and commit their actions to whatever builds them as a clear incarnation and manifestation of the church in the world. And most importantly, the spiritual resources of the church, which were once reserved only to ordained ministers, and to those in religious life are now available to families. Third point, the home is the first school of human enrichment. It is at home where one learns endurance and the joy of work, fraternal love, forgiveness, divine worship in prayer, and the offering of one's life. In a short but meaningful article, Alejandro Garcia Rivera describes the significance of home altars for Hispanics. And I quote, my family had never been very clear about the boundary where worship or service begins and ends. Much less, my family had never identified the church building itself as that defining sacred space. Our family's home altar, a typical Hispanic Catholic custom, embodied this resistance to defining sacred space or faithful service, unquote. This childhood experience of Rivera can be a typical experience of someone who grew up in a Catholic home. It is almost always that the home is adorned with an altar. At times, this altar can be very elaborate and filled with images of various saints. The Blessed Virgin Mary and of Jesus Christ, it is decorated with flowers and candles are lighted every morning and at dusk. It is where the family prays the rosary daily or on special occasions. The significance that Rivera attaches to altars is not very far from how Filipino Catholics appreciate their altars. The altar is no less a sign of bold faith. It is where families pray together in times of fear and struggle. Thus, the domestic church brings faith, hope, and charity to those who must fight at the forefront of our day. The mothers, fathers, and children of the Catholic family. Moreover, an article written by Joseph D. White points out the, the importance of family as a privileged space for catechesis, but also underscores the vicissitudes of time that pose challenges to this reality, which in general include the following, hectic schedules and divided attention, both on the part of parents and children. Knowing the value of an intact nuclear family to the life of the church and society, White proposes the following interventions which can be done on the level of parishes. Family-friendly grade level catechetical programs. Now these are actually uh, proposals for catechetical program, but somewhere down the line, these can be adopted uh, in the future of homeschooling. So here, choose a grade level textbook series with a strong family of component, for example, selection written specifically for families as part of each lesson. Involve parents as volunteers and give them plenty of options with respect to roles. Where possible, order lessons so that multiple children from the same family are working on the same themes at the same times of the year. This makes it easier for families to learn together. Provide intergenerational experiences for children preparing for the sacraments host day retreats that are designed for the whole family, 
with perhaps some time for parents and children separately and some opportunities for experiences together. Family-sensitive adult formation. Offer a variety of adult formation classes and experiences that allow adults to choose based on their interests and phases of life. Make adult formation practical. Offer topics that intersect with the daily life of adult learners, such as being a faithful Catholic in the workplace, raising Catholic kids and teens and other real life concerns. Make adult formation available and practical for families. Considering, consider offering adult classes at the same time as children's classes when adults are already coming to the parish. So the family is indeed a cradle of education. The expression Ecclesia Domestica reminds parents that they are duty bound to ensure that their children grow up to become good people. They make this happen through their leadership and love for their kids and by transforming their homes to become schools of faith, hope, and love. The second point of my discussion, opportunities and challenges brought about by bringing the school to home. To understand school at home, I studied already existing programs that already support or implement it. From there, I hope to construct an understanding that would somehow apply to the scenario engendered by the new normal, where movements and interactions are limited. Most models that I read are from overseas, hence would need to be reimagined in order to apply to the Philippine context. To begin with, I'll be using the phrase school at home to refer to the idea of continuing education at home in response to the te temporary closure of schools as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is to distinguish it from technical phrases like homeschooling, home study, and home instruction, which I will cursorily describe in what will follow. What is meant by school at home? Here, I would like to provide a propagetic understanding. As a parent, my exposure to school at home is limited to when I see my wife sit with my kids to help them with their assignments or prepare them for summative assessments. And if I were only to rely on this experience as basis for my understanding of what a full-blown school at home means, then by the looks of it, I would say it is a very tiring and rigorous task. And I wonder how many parents are ready to undertake something like that too much too soon. I came across several terms lifted by Eric Burns from the United States Department of Education. These are already established types, formats, or practices in aid of learning or education. And it is safe to assume that they can only indirectly respond to the situation of the new normal in the Philippines. I will try to assimilate those ideas that I can use for the purpose of giving hints, at least theoretically, for what Filipino parents are about to face unpreparedly, prolonged and sustained school activities at home. So, as the idea of homeschool education is about to become normative in the Philippine context, it is crucial that we begin to examine the impact of this environment for parents and for students. Homeschooling. The provision of compulsory education in the home as an alternative to traditional public-private schooling that is often motivated by parents' desire to exclude their children from traditional school environment. <clears throat> in homeschool education, the parent provides the majority of their child's academic instruction based <clears throat> out of the home without sending their child to a place called school. Close mo Home instruction. Instruction provided in the home by educational personnel for children with special needs or their parents. And home study, a studying done at home outside school hours, including hours and school assignments, community projects, or individual problems. At this juncture, excuse me.
at this juncture, I gathered the following terms or ideas which I think are useful for how I could best characterize or describe the ramifications of having school at home in the new normal in the Philippine context. First, it is going to be compulsory for those who would opt to continue the education of their kids in the new normal. For how long this scenario will endure, we cannot really say at this time, since the last words from the higher ops is that no face-to-face -face classes shall commence pending the discovery of a vaccine for COVID-19. So maybe after 10 years. Second, school at home is definitely going to be an alternative to traditional or conventional education. I support the persistence of DepEd in this since we do not know yet how long the race for the vaccine will run. Although we are yet to see how the actionable plans of the national government will unfold come opening of classes this AY 2020-21. What is clear is that school at home is the best alternative for now. Third, school at home is motivated by parental desire since parents can't be forced to enroll their kids now given that face-to-face -face classes are suspended. In other words, it really depends on parents to decide whether or not they will allow schooling to take place in their homes. Hence, only those parents who are willing to accept the gargantuan responsibility that school at home entails will enroll their kids. Fourth, in a school at home setting, instruction is provided by educational personnel or parents. By this, we can safely assume that it is going to be a participative, collaborative, or cooperative endeavor of all stakeholders involved. For example, the school, parents, teachers, and students. In other words, if it is any consolation at all, we can expect school at home to still have teacher supervision. Exactly how this will happen, we are yet to be informed. Fifth, studying is done at home or outside of school. Work on school assignments, community projects, or individual problems. Again, let me just point out that this is the part which need to become clearly actionable in the days leading to the opening of classes. For those who have digital, technical, and logistical capacity, this can be done. In fact, some schools are already implementing this using their own learning management systems, or LMS. The glaring obstacle to this is the digital divide, which is the upshot of a protracted economic divide in the Philippines which gives us that nagging feeling that education from being a right that is due to all might be reduced to a privilege that is available only to the few moneyed class. Now, why do families choose school at home? The second question that I would like to answer is why Filipino families should choose or at least keep an open mind the school at home approach. Take note that the materials which I surveyed or reviewed are from overseas where the subjects are parents in private religious hybrid homeschool. In general, parents choose hybrid homeschool because of the following reasons. Schedule of flexibility, family time and influence, and control of the curriculum, religious and political reasons. Let me begin with family time. As I have mentioned early on, one of the most as I've mentioned early on, most of us have already embraced the idea of school as second home to our children, which means that aside from being at home, they spend a great deal of their time in school. Some complain that because of school, they don't get to spend as much time with their kids. And somehow because of the generally flexible schedule of hybrid homeschool, families get to spend more time together. According to one of the respondents, the hybrid homeschool model is helpful for family time because students get to work at their own pace and they get more time with mom and dad and siblings, interacting in a less structured environment. The bottom line is that the hybrid homeschool is that kind of education that has the indirect consequence of strengthening families. Second is flexibility. Hybrid homeschool models are flexible enough to allow students to engage in other activities. A flexible schedule frees up students to hone their talents or skills in other fields like sports and arts after they are done with their schoolwork. According to one respondent, her daughter could get her schoolwork at the hybrid homeschool done faster and she was in the gym 
20 plus hours a week. Hybrid homeschool allows self-paced learning, thus giving students the pleasure of working on their schoolwork when it is most convenient for them or when they are most productive. In other words, for those who see the value of hybrid homeschool, learning, no time is wasted and students tend to be more productive as they get schoolwork done at their own convenience. So after school works are accomplished, kids can engage in other activities and to top it all, have more quality, have more quality time with the rest of the family. Other respondents would still want a bit of structure even in this flexible structure in the sense that parents would rely on teachers for all the planning and grade recording so that they can focus on seeing to it that kids get their schoolwork done. Individualized attention. In a hybrid homeschool format, students get the individualized attention that they need compared to the learning in classroom setting where there are students involved. Individualized attention helps the student to stay focused in the lesson or in the activities at hand, thus facilitating the learning process. Some students tend to finish their tasks when given help or special attention. It is interesting to note that individualized attention is not just intended for academics, but also to monitor students who may not be lagging in academics, but need to be checked when it comes to behavior or attitude. Lastly, curriculum and religion or values formation. Some parents give way to religion. In the survey conducted by Vern, a little over 80% of the respondents value religion compared to the less than 20% who think that it is not important. In a hybrid homeschool setup, the religion may be given the attention that it deserves from parents who are very particular about this topic. To this point, some participants explicitly mentioned that they want to maintain the identity of their religion or reinforce the values and lessons that they want their children to imbibe. The hybrid homeschool, the hybrid homeschool setup allows this because not only are parents able to teach their kids themselves, but also that religion is reinforced by the fact that kids are immersed in a community that values it. I offered the following as takeaways in a hybrid homeschool setup that can work in favor or against the school at home that we envision come opening of academic year 2020-21. It is not going to be hybrid because no student will go to school without the vaccine. In cases where both parents work, nobody will be left at home to look after the kids who are studying. However, if parents agree that one of them stay at home to monitor the progress of their kids, then that would be good. Those in congested residential areas might not be able to achieve a conducive space for learning. But let's not discount the fact that there are those who are able to make it work through sheer determination and resourcefulness. Those in far-flung areas might be out of reach from teachers who help reinforce learning. However, there are teachers who are heroic and are willing to make sacrifices to make a difference. The teacher-student ratio might hinder efficient and effective collaboration between parents and teachers. And lastly, the flexible setup might give students time to finish their studies at home and at the same time do chores at home. Now, what are the benefits of school at home? Naturally, the reasons why people are attracted to have school at home is because they see that it is good. So when we talk about reasons, we are actually also talking about benefits, pros, or advantages. I surveyed some literature and I would like to highlight the data from three sources which enumerate the advantages of homeschool. Again, please take, please take note that my sources here are mostly foreign, although one is homegrown. Now, these are the reasons. First, family time. Family time. Homeschool creates strong bonds with their children. It engenders family togetherness. Families enjoy spending more time with their children. It draws families close, it draws closer together the spouses in homeschool together with their children. And families are able to take their children to vacation when school is still in session. Although of course, this is something that we cannot do yet. Flexibility. Uh, homeschool creates a flexible schedule, not 
creates a flexible schedule which is not possible for children enrolled in conventional school. Individualized attention. Uh, demonstrate to their children that education is fun, adapt teaching methods best suited to how their children learn, spend extra time with their children on difficult concepts, and move after children master a subject or concept, provide their children with a personal interaction that teachers in large classrooms are not able to provide, spend extra time helping their children develop any special talents they possess, including music and including arts and uh, children tend to become more achievers. And then of curriculum, parents are able to determine the curriculum and their children's schooling schedule. Religion and values formation. Uh, provide religious and ethical instructions for their children, shelter children from school violence, drugs and other negative behaviors that children in public schools frequently encounter Discuss controversial topics at their discretion with their children. Assist children during adolescence and trying times. Character building and sociabilities. Now, this is surprising, uh, but some parents find homeschool as somewhat cheaper compared to conventional. So a careful observation of the benefits or advantages of school at home is that most, if not all, of the advantages are actually interconnected or they overlap. In other words, in terms of, of, of causality, it is actually easy to argue that one benefit is an effect or caused by one or the other. For example, the, fact, the flexibility that school at home allows, which impacts the time that family members spend together, leads to a strengthening of family ties, which in turn facilitate individualized attention which actually allows parents to have a say in the curriculum to the extent that the curriculum becomes tailored in such a way that it can lead to the building of the character, values, and religious convictions of their children. What research informs us is that homeschool actually works. There are studies which show that students who are products of such school models or format outdo their counterparts who study in conventional type or educational models. This is something that we can all argue about, and I am in no way suggesting that we abandon the conventional type of education models. As the saying goes, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What I am saying is that we don't need to work from scratch to make school at home work as an alternative while we temporarily confine our kids to the safe spaces of our homes because of COVID-19, which is still a clear and present danger. The issue that is crucial though is that in the studies that were made, homeschool was a choice made by parents, which actually implies that they have made that they have the means to make it work. That is, time, good internet access, conducive learning atmosphere, and this is just to name a few. The problem is when you look at the homes when you look at homeschooling as an alternative to education on a national scale. As I have already previously mentioned, the situation of poverty in the Philippines is a deal breaker. The deprivations that it causes are debilitating to the point that to weather this impending educational crisis, there is nothing else that we can all summon except our battle-tested Filipino brand of resiliency. By all indications, school at home in the Philippines is a long shot, but it is a shot worth taking. This may be a platitude or a motherhood statement, but we cannot just languish or wallow in the situation while our kids stand idle at home. This is the final point, imperatives for parents in the new normal, making the school come to life at home. As I have set out to accomplish from the beginning, what I would like to offer today is the kind of mindset that we parents ought to have as we enter into this vastly unfamiliar new normal, which would impinge on the education of our children. Our uncertainties, stress even, come with the impression that we are obliged to replicate school at home and with this have it equipped with utilities or devices that give it a semblance of an actual classroom. This is not to mention that we feel ill-equipped with teaching strategies. There are only very few practical or actionable solutions that I can offer and these are all called out from materials which are accessible online. At best, 
my contribution in bringing the idea of the Ecclesia Domestica as a model is to allay our fears that it is impossible to bring school at home and it is improbable for us parents to become teachers. As the expression Ecclesia Domestica reminds us, our homes are schools and we parents are teachers already. Therefore, we just need to reset our minds so that we can be realistic with our expectations. And as we always say as Filipinos, matutong mamaluktot kapag maiksi ang kumot. So the first point that I would like to stress here is openness to change. If you can change the situation, change your attitude. So what do we do as parents? What kind of mindset should we have? An article written by Ben Milne for British Broadcasting Corporation titled, Coronavirus, How Do I Homeschool My Children and What Does Bite Size Offer? discusses the difficulties, actually impossibility of homeschool. In fact, the article begins with a sad quote from the joint statement by the main teachers union to wit, and I quote, we cannot homeschool the nation's children, unquote. This is after Milne stated that there is little expectation that parents are able to replace teachers. The same tenor is expressed by Jenny Marder in her article titled, Forget Homeschooling During Pandemic, Teach Life Skills Instead, where she says, the high hopes from parents about homeschooling their children had been replaced by the harsh reality that being a teacher is, well, hard. And that it, it requires a degree of preparation and focus that many parents simply don't have right now. On the contrary, as I pointed out early on, there are studies which provide, prove that homeschool works and kids turn out to be just fine after going through homeschool. It was effective because parents embraced their role in the education of their children, knowing the difficulties that it entails. I agree that doing this on a national scale is going to be hard. It becomes even harder for a third world country with probably the worst internet connection with both parents working. And this is just to name a few obstacles. As parents, if we cannot change the situation, we can at least change the defeatist attitude that is slowly creeping in. And as I have said, we can learn from online articles which offer actionable solutions or do-it-yourself strategies to help make school at home workable. Second point, resourcefulness. As they say, necessity is the mother of all inventions. It is safe to assume that sending our kids to school to learn does not mean that we have everything, that we, have, that we leave everything to the school and we just wait for the school to cough up our kids after graduation already bearing a diploma. Most schools, if not all, by some direct or indirect means, engage parents as partners or collaborators in the education of their children. Now, the, situations, the situation calls for a more heightened sense of cooperation and sacrifices ought to be made on both ends for the sake of our children. While as parents, we cannot go the full route that teachers go when it comes to teaching, there are little things that we can do to see to it that school is brought to session at home. Parents are offered some practical guides or do-it-yourself strategies that could help make school at home workable. After ser surveying related articles, I was able to come up with a list of commonly suggested activities for parents. One, maintaining a degree of normality rather than worrying about a children's academic progress. Second, creating regular routines and study habits. Third, teaching kids about life skills. Third, addressing children's fears. Fourth, having special time in. And lastly, using positive disciplines. Moreover, in an article titled Parenting During a Pandemic, a Family Journal, Sadie Stably reminds parents of their duty to help their kids overcome this COVID-19 phase without any severe damage to their emotional or social development. To be able to do this, Stably suggests the following actionable points, mostly life skills. Firstly, during a vulnerable, during, firstly, during a vulnerable time such as now, it becomes imperative that children understand the importance of human values like compassion, empathy, patience, optimism, among others. Secondly, this is also a suitable opportunity to exemplify to children that tools beyond academics are vital to lead a fulfilling life. 
children at home can be encouraged to participate in easy household activities or learn a new or learn new skills to understand values like teamwork, involvement, and collaboration. Assigning them tasks can also impart sense of independence, responsibility, and accomplishment. Unquote. Without intending to romanticize the backlash of this COVID-19 pandemic on the education of our children and care for them, this can be an opportunity for us parents to deeply root or anchor our kids on the values of the family and for ourselves to be rooted in the responsibilities that are inherent in us by virtue of our being parents. Our children will look back at this time and remember with fondness how the family steered them past the troubled waters of COVID-19. You can disagree with me, but I think that our religious backgrounds are indispensable resources where we can draw inspiration from, especially during challenging times, such as the one that we're experiencing now. Now, this is the last point. Make the home a blended school and church. Indeed, the expression Ecclesia Domestica is of Christian origin. Its content articulates the responsibilities of parents to rear their children to be good Christians in good or bad weather. You may or may not agree with me that the following themes that I derive from the expression Ecclesia Domestica are values that transcend the religion. Namely, parents should lead by word and example. Parents should encourage their children with special care. And parents should make the home the first school of human enrichment. In the long and short of it, all religion that I know, and I would like to aver that even those people who do not embrace any religion at all, look at the family in some spiritual way. The bond between parents and children is truly special, and we could tap into this inner resource. Then all the difficulties of school at home, even if they would not disappear, would be bearable, and all sacrifices worth taking. As I have pre previously discussed, studies show that the level of success that homeschool programs sustain is widely attributed to what the family was able to contribute to the whole process, such as having dinner, as well as taking time to talk and listen to one another. The reason why families prefer homeschool revolve around the idea that parents want to spend more time with their children. They want to have a more hands-on approach to the education of their kids. And there are specific values that they feel they could impart to their children at home than in school. Let me just repeat. Studies show that all these efforts of involving the family in the process of education pay great dividends as students turned out to be successful in life. Now, let me now move, move to the conclusion. How then should we look at home? This is just a play of words, but hopefully I can get the message across. In this time of new normal, we should look at the home as a blended church and school where parents are co-teachers to their children. The expression Ecclesia Domestica offers a great source of inspiration for parents who may be struggling to come to terms with the impending demands of COVID-19. Anchored in the virtues of faith, hope, and love, parents should lovingly lead their children in their education as it is going to be undertaken at home. As important as academics may be, it is not the be-all and the end-all of school at home. Homeschool has proven to be effective, but as we have mentioned, the conditions that make such programs successful may not always be met, especially for parents and children who have very limited resources in life. But as I have directly and indirectly stressed, a home that is viewed as both church and school by the whole family can make a difference. Maraming salamat po.